Copacabana, Ipanema, girl from Ipanema indeed, football, samba, Brazil as you know it and love it. Actually, I've had as much as I can take of that crap about Brazil. I really have. I am so tired of Brazilian cliches. In fact, there is not a country I know that is so imprisoned and locked in by stereotypes than Brazil. So I want to show you one or two different parts of Brazil that I've been looking into over the past three years or so. And I suppose I should start with this one, which is Rocinha. Rocinha is the biggest favela or slum um, in the middle of Rio de Janeiro, but it's not only the biggest slum in Rio, it's the biggest slum in Brazil, and indeed many say that it's the biggest slum in Latin America. There are about 120,000 people who live in this tiny enclosed space running up a hill from the Atlantic. And what's really extraordinary about this favela is it is surrounded by three of the wealthiest districts in Rio de Janeiro. And when you say wealthy in Brazil, you mean oligarch-style wealthy. And right in the middle is this favela. So in late 2013, I went to live there for a few months. And uh, I lived uh, right at the top of the top of the favela in a room the size of a prison cell with a, a creaky old bunk bed and uh, a broken cupboard and a small plastic table and chair. And uh, it was without air conditioning, and believe you me, it gets unbelievably hot in uh, the favelas of Rio. It's a semi-tropical climate. I didn't get a single night's sleep uninterrupted for three months when I was living in that particular room. And um, why was that? Well, there's endless amounts of noise. There are dogs barking. There are couples rowing. There are exchanges of gunfire. There are funk parties going on all day and all night. And then this is interspersed with biblical downpours. I mean, rain the like of which you've never seen, so that within two minutes you can't see two or three yards in front of you. And then, of course, at two o'clock in the morning, the rain comes through the roof where you're staying, and it's all hands to the deck. And uh, the smell, the stink, because when the rain comes down, well, what happens? It's open sewers. And so everything spills out of the sewers, everything imaginable, and it stinks. It absolutely stinks. So I can tell you that for the 120,000 people who live in Rossinia, which interestingly enough, is known as the Kensington of favelas. <laughs> Life is really, really hard. So uh, I wanted to find out what it was about this extraordinary country, Brazil, because I'm going to explain to you about Brazil in a second. It's one of the most amazing countries of the world. How come we know so little about Brazil? And I went to live in the favela because I think part of the key to understanding why Brazil is unable to project its complexity and its potential power because of the existence of uh, places like these. So when I went to uh, uh, Rossinha, there was a reason why I went there. I went to study the life of this man, on Antonio Francisco Bonfim Lopez, or Nem of Rossinha. And then was a fascinating character because until the age of 25, 26, he had a respectable job in the middle of Rio, distributing the uh, Rio's equivalent of the Radio Times. And then age 25, his 10-month-old daughter developed a terrible and very rare autoimmune disease called histiocytosis X, or Langerhan cell histiocytosis. And this had a terrible effect on his family because he lives in a favela and he doesn't have money. And the treatment for this disease, it took them a long time to discover what it was in the first place, was very expensive. And if you live in a favela, you have no access to capital or loans or anything like that. So the only thing this man could do 
having lived a respectable life, at the age of 25, was to go and borrow the money from the only person in the favela who would lend it, and that was the man who ran the drugs trade in Rosinha. And the only way that Antonio could pay the money back was to go and work for him. And he was very bright, naturally very intelligent, uneducated up until about the age of 11, but he could read and write, and he had a natural entrepreneurial brain and after some terrible events, including a civil war inside Rossinia, it's a very bloody place, um, he came to the top of, his top of the pile when his boss was assassinated by the police. So it was his story I was interested uh, in examining. And uh, the reason why is, is to try and explain the failure of Brazil. Brazil is an enormous country. Um, you can't imagine until you go there just how diverse and huge it is. And it has resources the like of which most other countries can only dream of. Did you know, for example, that when it comes to iron ore alone, Brazil can supply the whole world with its known resources for 500 years? It has everything. It has oil. It has rare earth. It has, of course, the great Amazon, the giver of life to the whole world. But not only that, as an agricultural power, it's extraordinary. It's the largest exporter of beef in the world. It's the largest exporter of orange juice, of coffee, of soya. And yet we know so little about it. It's a very, very wealthy country, but we don't understand why it doesn't work. And so that's what... I wanted to try and understand when it came to looking at NEM because there are some other statistics which are less happy about Brazil. It has 2.7% of the world's population. It has 10% of the world's homicides every year. 50,000 Brazilians are killed at the hands of Brazi other Brazilians every year. And the great majority of those Brazilians who are killed are young, male, unemployed, black, and they live in the favelas. Because there's another thing that we don't really know about Brazil. We don't associate it with such things as apartheid in South Africa, for example, or the uh, segregation of the southern United States. Now, in the 300 years of slavery to the United States, the transport of black slaves to the United States, 500,000 people arrived in the US. Over that same period, a little longer, into Brazil, there arrived over five million slaves. And so the experience of slavery, which we know through Hollywood and through novels and that sort of thing, is incomparably more important in Brazil than it is in the United States. And one thing that the Brazilians have never got over is the inequality, the immense wealth of their elite, of their elite and the immense poverty of what goes below. Now, everything was kind of okay. The favelas were ignored by the state. Nobody really had much to do with the favelas. They self-organized, and they've been self-organizing for 50 years. They have effectively their own governments. But then one terrible thing happened in the 1980s. So, in 1982, people might say that Latin American cultures are very violent intrinsically. But in 1982, did you know that the homicide rate, the murder rate in Rio de Janeiro was exactly the same as the murder rate in New York City? 21.9 per 100,000 head of population. Seven years later, in 1989, the murder rate in Rio de Janeiro was three times greater than it was in the United States, which in New York City, which had remained pretty much stagnant during that period. And the reason for that, well actually, although the reason is cocaine and it comes from Colombia and Peru and Bolivia, the real reason is because we in Europe were consuming huge amounts of cocaine in this time. We were adopting American cultural habits of drug consumption. And the Colombians who had been pouring cocaine into the United States. They could no longer sell anymore because the United States, although it has 5% of the world's population, consumes 40% of the world's cocaine, and they couldn't get any more up their nose. And so they had to look elsewhere. And they looked to Europe 
And there was a great market in Europe. But in order to get the cocaine from Colombia or Bolivia and Peru to Europe, they had to go through Brazil. And when you become the major transit route for a narcotic, you develop your own habit. But because we have the war on drugs, a policy that is determined in Washington, in London, and other major Western capitals where cocaine is consumed, that means the profits you can make out of cocaine are absolutely enormous, huge profits. And with those profits, the young, poor, black, unemployed young men of the favelas found that they could buy weapons and they could not just buy pistols, they could buy semi-automatics, eventually rocket-propelled grenades. And so the police, who showed little interest and only rarely came into the favelas, would now go nowhere near those favelas because it was so violent. And the 1990s in Rio de Janeiro became an absolute hell. It was chaos. Now, the problem for the favelas in Rio, which is different from the rest of, the, uh, rest of Brazil, is because of the peculiar topography of Rio. The favelas aren't just on the periphery as they are in towns like, cities like Sao Paulo. The favelas in Rio are actually right in the middle, in all those residential areas, and they're right in the middle of Copacabana and Ipanema. And so, when you start getting violence spilling out of the favelas into all the rich areas, well, finally, the state decides to do something about it. Now, I was interested in Antonio. This, by the way, is Rossinia. Here you see one of those rich areas, the beginning of San Conrado. Over there you can see the tip of Ipanema and Copacabana. And just behind it, there's another rich area called uh, Gavea. So they had from Rossinia, Rossinia was very peculiar. The reason why it was so successful is because it had those three rich areas around it. It sold more cocaine than any other favela in Rio. It sold 60% of Rio's consumption because of the fact that its market was there. And what interested me about Antonio Lopez, Nem of Rossinia, was that he understood that if you lower levels of violence, because he was in control of the business for five years, he had 120 heavily armed men under him, he was effectively the prime minister and the head of the Chamber of Commerce of 120,000 people. He was under 30 years old, and he had no experience in anything. But he ran that place for five years, and he ran it quite efficiently, and he ran it by lowering the level of violence so that Rossinia became a brand. Everyone wanted to visit Rossinia. Footballers, the entire Brazilian national football team went there. Pop stars went there. Politicians went there. And above all else, young people wanting to buy cocaine went there. And so he turned this into a very remarkable place. But with the approach of the Olympics and the approach of the World Cup, the World Cup was in 2014, the Olympics are just coming, the state finally had to do something about all these favelas with, its co with their cocaine and their violence. And they introduced a new policy called pacification, whereby the police would go in and try and arrest or kill um, the main leaders of the drug gangs. And Antonio was, for the police, public enemy number one in Rio. So when he was arrested, this is film of his arrest. It was like the O.J. Simpson chase in Los Angeles, which was all filmed. Antonio, that's him there in the middle. His arrest was filmed as three different police forces actually drew their weapons at one another in order to have the prize of arresting Antonio Lopez. And everyone was taking selfies of him. But behind this rest, arrest is a very extraordinary story, a bizarre mystery, which I reveal in the book, and I'm not going to spoil your unalloyed pleasure by revealing exactly why this arrest is quite so weird as it is, but um, it's uh, well worth finding out why uh, Antonio was in the boot of that car from where he was 
taken out by one of the police forces. Now, I went to visit Antonio 10 times in a maximum security jail deep in the interior of, uh, of uh, Brazil, and it was a very weird experience interviewing him. Some people have said that uh, I'm too soft on Antonio, and uh, to finish up, I want to, uh, I want to address that issue. The point is, is, is that anyone who becomes involved in the drugs trade in favelas will be involved with violence. But they have become involved in the drugs trade in the favelas because the state has ignored the favelas for 50 years and because the policies of Western governments when it comes to drug consumption, the war on drugs, mean that there is very little else for these people in the favelas to do if they want to get on in the world and earn money. And why I think Antonio was so special, why Nemo Frosinia is a really interesting case, is, is that for him, it was very, very important that when he was in control, that part of the money that he made went back into the welfare of the favela and wherever possible, he would reduce those levels of violence. Because even in the worst situations, humans have a moral choice. And as moral choices go, I think Antonio made the right ones in a really difficult situation. And to end with, like all drug bosses, he has um, YouTube, YouTube songs sung about him aplenty. And... Uh, here is one of his songs which I have uh, translated for you and I'll read out as I fade out from this talk. This is, I saved my daughter. Life was cruel with me. I made a choice to save the one I loved the most. I made a deal. I begged for God's sake. Jesus, don't punish me. I was against my commandments, but I had to save my daughter. My soul cries and one day I will go away. Many judge me, but they don't know my story. I lived together with the death. I lost my freedom, but when, was need, when it was needed, I was not a coward. Society knows how to criticize. It's easy to say for those who are not in my shoes. I did everything for love and don't regret it. Nowadays, to see her smiling, it is worth the pain. I beg to the King of Heavens to forgive the actions I took to save her. I am a citizen who had no option. I had my reasons, but I still beg for forgiveness. And to end, I'd just like to say that Eduarda, her life was saved. She's now a very bright 16-year-old girl. She goes to school. She's a very good reader, and she will be a credit to her father when he finally comes out of prison in many years' time. Thank you.